In this video, you're gonna learn how to turn a boring, plain MDF subwoofer box into something that looks absolutely amazing. The enclosure itself is already fully assembled. More on the assembly process later. This is a very unique build. It uses an eight inch down firing subwoofer paired with a 12 inch front firing passive radiator. All of the parts are Dayton Audio. You can learn more about them down in the links in the video description. With the box fully finished, it's time to put a finish on the box. But first, a little test bump. I'm afraid I may have sent it a little too hard. Oh yeah, smoky. I blew the sub. I made a mistake. And I destroyed the subwoofer. Without a subwoofer, the project's over, but I don't give up that easy and you should not either. It turns out I've got another eight inch subwoofer sitting on a shelf. But we'll try that one out in just a bit, so keep watching. But first, let's use this as an opportunity to take apart this sub here. This is the all new Ultimax version two. This is the eight inch model. And there's something cool deep inside that I wanted to show you. This yellow thing here is a spider. It's part of the suspension. These Ultimax Max subwoofers all have two of them, a dual spider. The subwoofer also has shorting rings. You can see one of them right here on top of the pull piece. That's the piece inside the magnet. At least I think that's the shorting ring. If it's not, I'm sure someone will jump down in the comments and tell me otherwise. It's a really well-built subwoofer. It's designed for sound quality and it sounded fine until I clipped it and sent that sucker to the moon. If you look inside the voice coil, you can see some vertical lines. That's where the voice coil former had warped and started scraping against the pull piece. I knew the sub was gone because I could hear that scraping when the sub was playing. So it's time for something different. As luck would have it, I have an 8 inch Savard high Q left over from another project. Dropping it into WinISD, it looks like the Savard subwoofer will actually outperform the Ultimax. The Savard is the black line, the Ultimax is the red line. So I should actually be able to get more low end extension out of the Savard subwoofer. All right. How was she? Was she good? It wouldn't be really fair to say that the Savard subwoofer is a better subwoofer than the X-Max. They're just different subwoofers. Good? Different? The Savard can handle more power, it's got more X-Max, but it's also a little bit less sensitive and it's 50 bucks more than the Ultimax. Nobody likes change. They're both great subwoofers and both would work for this build, but the Savard is just a little bit better driver for this specific box. I've got affiliate deals with both Parts Express and with Savard, and so I've got discount codes down in the video description if you wanna buy anything from either one of those companies. It's time to run a few tests and collect some hard data. This black box right here is called a DATS. That's D-A-T-S, DATS. You can use it to find the tuning frequency of a ported or or passive radiator enclosure. Make sure you disconnect the amp before you use the DATS. Never run a DATS sweep with the amp connected. Here are the results and they're kind of odd. We should expect a plot with two peaks and a valley in the center of the peaks. That valley is your tuning frequency. If you zoom in real close, you can see that lower peak is there. It's just not very tall. It looks like our tuning frequency is close to about 25 Hertz with four discs installed on the passive radiator. Compare this to a more typical sweep, which looks like this. So why do we get this odd result? This odd result is what you get when the resonant frequency of the passive radiator is much, much lower than the resonant frequency frequency of the subwoofer. This big passive has a resonant frequency below 20 hertz without any weights installed, and the FS of the subwoofer is about 34 hertz. For kicks and giggles, this is what it looks like with just one disc. Now the enclosure is tuned to about 32 hertz, and that low frequency peak is just a bit more prominent. So now I gotta pull the PR back out and put the weights back on, so hang tight, I'll catch up with you in just a minute. I've already got the amp out, so I may as well pull the sub out and start applying the finish to the enclosure. For this, I'm gonna be using some veneer. This is real wood, it's walnut veneer with a paper backing. To adhere the veneer to the enclosure, I'm trying out something I've never tried before, something new to me, this is heat activated glue. You roll it onto both sides, you let it dry, then you put the two pieces together and apply heat to activate the glue. While I'm rolling on the glue, I want to take a second to say thank you to all of my patrons over on Patreon. I've been uploading pictures of this build to Patreon, so all my patrons know exactly how this is about to turn out. Patrons get behind the scenes updates and previews. They know what's going on before the rest of us do. All my $10 patrons get their name in the video and $25 and up patrons get a great big shout out in the video. So thank you to Jonathan, 
Taylor, Joaquin, JD America, Timothy, and Bo. If you like these videos, the best way to make sure I can keep doing them is to head over to Patreon and sign up. If you pay for a whole year up front, you get 10% off of membership. This is a new experience for me. I've never done this before. So I have no idea if I'm using too much adhesive or not enough. I have no idea how this is gonna turn out. If you're watching my videos, there's a really good chance that you're watching me do something that I've never done before. If I'm perfectly honest, doing something for the first time, no experience whatsoever, and showing it on film is probably kind of stupid. Because there's a really good chance I'm going to look like a dumbass. Sometimes people will jump in the comments and say, I'm not professional. No, I'm not professional. This is not the professional audio guy YouTube channel. I am no different than all of you watching. Two hours later. The glue appears to be dry, so now it's time to adhere it the uh, veneer to the enclosure. Let me show you what I'm working with here. The game plan here is to bend this veneer around this curve. It's a pretty broad radius, so I should be able to bend it. I'm not sure if I need to start at the edge here and work my way that way, or if I need to start at the baffle here and then work out from the baffle. We'll just have to give it a try and see how it goes. Seems like it's working. Most importantly, don't tell my wife I know how to use one of these things. That's not something she needs to know. And I want to give a great big shout out to Tom Zarbo with Zarbo Audio Projects. That guy is an artist, man. He is a master. I'll be sure to leave a link down below to his channel so y'all can check it out. I learned this watching his channel. I definitely wouldn't be doing this if he hadn't have made a video where he was all like, oh yeah, you just iron the stuff on. This is working out better than anything I've ever used to try to adhere a veneer. So I'm really happy with it. And I made this Pac-Man shape on purpose so I wouldn't have to wrap all the way around it. I'd have a place to stop. Okay, some time has passed. It takes 24 hours for that veneer glue to fully set up and cure. It's been, I don't know, 18 hours. You can see it right back here. I've done a thorough job of masking it off because I'm gonna cover the back and the bottom with this textured coating here. It's also from Parts Express. Pretty much everything in the build's from Parts Express. I'll make sure to give you links to it. I've got a discount code with Parts Express. So you can get 5% off with the code DIY5. I usually wear gloves when I work with this stuff because it's messy, but I'm out of gloves. I'll have to go to Harbor Freight and get some more gloves. Before you do this, go fix yourself a sandwich. You can get yourself an empty tub from this lunch meat. It fits the textured roller just about perfect.
for the finish, I'm using a product called Rubio Mono Coat. To prep the surface, you sand it with 180 grit and clean it thoroughly. This is an interesting product. It's an oil finish with an accelerator. You mix it in a three to one ratio and then just wipe it on and buff it. After you've buffed it on, wait about 30 minutes and wipe off the excess with a lint-free towel. It took about 30 milliliters of oil. That's about an ounce in freedom units. While I'm applying that finish, I wanna talk about some of the technical aspects of the build. This is actually part two of a two-part video and I got some really cool comments on the first video. A passive radiator is only in phase at the tuning frequency. And at that tuning frequency, it's gonna be one cycle behind the active driver. Sure, you can use a second subwoofer if you're building a project, build it however you want. A second subwoofer is gonna require double the airspace. And this passive radiator gives me the ability to tune to get that low end extension that I'm shooting for. More on that in just a bit. I didn't use a port because a port would be huge in this build. Even though the box is kind of large because there's a second chamber for the amplifier, the actual chamber that the subwoofer sits in isn't very large. And when the chamber gets smaller, the port has to get longer to maintain the same tuning frequency. And on top of that, because I'm tuning this so low, the port has to get longer to hit that low tuning frequency. When I model this in WinISD using a ported enclosure, in order to get the airspeed velocity down to levels where you wouldn't notice chuffing in your home theater, you need about 20 square inches of port area. And that's gonna give you a port that's 53 inches long or just shy of four and a half feet. Once you fit that port inside the box, just the air inside the port is gonna take up an extra 0.6 cubic feet. That makes this box 25% larger than it already is. At that point, you probably should just consider with going with a larger driver and maybe EQing it to get the response you want. Because even though there's a big enough surface for a 12 inch cutout on this box, that's not what dictates the size subwoofer you can use. It's the airspace inside the box that tells us what size subwoofer you can use. So yeah, I could fit a 12 on the front of the box, but that doesn't mean I should use a 12. With the finish applied, this thing looks absolutely stunning it turned out great that was worth all the extra effort the wife approval factor of this thing is off the chart this thing looks like a piece of mid-century modern furniture it's like a piece of art i can't wait to hear it let's put it all back together I don't typically take the time to wrap the wire in foam or Tessa tape or secure it somewhere in the subwoofer box. But in this case, the wire is actually gonna be dangling down onto the subwoofer. So it needs to be wrapped and secured. It's actually pretty easy to do because I've got a big 12 inch hole for the passive radiator. So why not go ahead and take that extra step? All right, here it is with the big PR on the front. It looks even better with the big passive radiator installed. Let's crank it up. All right, so I've been jamming away for a few minutes and I like the way it sounds. I'm really happy with this. It looks good, it sounds good, it's the complete package. If you're paying attention, you probably noticed a rattle. I wanna show you where that rattle's coming from. Let me turn the phone around here. So unfortunately, I don't have a good place to store my clamps. So what you're hearing is these guys rattling down here. Because of all the rattling in the garage, I don't feel like I can give you accurate distortion measurements, but I can give you a frequency response. So let's use Room EQ Wizard to run some sweeps and see what happens. All right, this is really consistent with what WinISD said we should get. There is a peak at 50 hertz with a roll off as the frequency drops and then a smaller peak just below 25 hertz. That's that passive radiator kicking in and doing its job, giving that low end extension. Look what happens when you start tinkering with the controls on the amp. So first, let's try a crossover at 105 hertz. I'm picking 105 just because there's a 105 labeled on the crossover, not for any particular reason. 
The green line here is with the crossover at 105 Hertz. You can clearly see the roll off in the upper frequency range. What if you want to flatten out that response a little bit? Let's try setting the EQ to about 50 Hertz and then pulling the level down by about 10 dB. This is what it looks like with the Q all the way up. You get a very wide cut in output, which is not what you want if your goal is to get rid of that peak at 50 Hertz. If you want to target a specific frequency, you turn that Q all the way down that gives us this orange line right here on the plot. You can see it matches the blue line at 50 Hertz and then merges back with the original green line at around 35 Hertz and 65 Hertz, meaning above and below that frequency, it's got no impact whatsoever on the sound. That extra EQ control takes this already awesome and unique build and kicks it up to the next level. To understand what I mean, you wanna watch the box assembly video, click right here to do that. Click right here to support me on Patreon. I'm Justin, this is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel, and I will see you on the next adventure.